The Super Retro Trio Plus was first announced at CES in January 2017, together with the Super Retro Boy, which is on hold because Nintendo is renewing their Game Boy trademark, and the Retrobit Multicard, which have been released recently. And here we are in 2018. Let's get to review. <laughs> Let me start off by saying this is not a sponsored video, I have not been in contact with Retrobit and everything I say is just my opinion. Just like on the original system, the Retro Trio Plus comes bundled in a nice box. Overall, everything is well packaged. The system is bundled with two controllers that feel a bit cheap but look pretty neat. It is powered through a 1M micro USB plug, which is a great improvement. I really prefer it when universal power supplies are used. When comparing the original Retro Trio to the Plus version, at first glance you'll notice the color differences and the obvious inclusion of an HDMI port. Also, the S-Video port has been omitted. Otherwise, there's not much change on the outside. And I must say this casing is perfect for me, with all the controller ports and switches right on the front, not on the sides like some other clones. This may seem cluttered, but I love to have everything within reach. To save these ports from dust, there is a cover on the front which sometimes hung when I pressed it on the original system. This doesn't seem to be an issue on the new system. On the top we have a switch to power on each system. Also the cartridge ports have been slightly altered. The plastic mold for the SNES port is a bit tighter than previously, which is an odd choice and especially noticeable on PAL or Japanese games. If you remove the PAL Super Game Boy or GBA adapter, it almost feels like you're about to break something. I will get back on these accessories later in the video. The first system came with some really impressive Super Nintendo style controllers. These felt almost exactly like the real thing, which was unlike any previous clone we've seen. These controllers actually act as universal controllers that can be used on the SNES, Mega Drive and NES system as well. For some reason, these universal controllers have a Genesis plug, which is an odd choice. If you insert original controllers in the SNES ports, you can't use those on the other systems. On the Plus system, some really great design choices were made to solve this problem. For starters, the cable length on the new controllers is much better. Previously, I had to use extension cords, but on these new controllers, the cables are quite a bit longer. The controllers come in a different shape too, but do use the SNES ports. So just make sure the controllers are switched to SNES and now the SNES ports are the universal ports for the system. This is great because now you can use any SNES controller for all systems universally. This includes wireless controllers like the ones from 8-bit Doe. The shape of the new controllers is the same as Retrobit's recent Super Retrocade system, of which I'm not a big fan for mentioned reasons. The buttons are a bit smaller than the originals and they just feel less smooth and sturdy and well, less nostalgic. However, this design change was probably for good reason, because the original controllers may have looked a bit too much like the real thing. A bit too much like the iconic ones Nintendo has been selling again when the Super Nintendo Classic Mini launched. 8-bit Doe has recently discontinued their SNES and NES style controller too, so some people may have received a legal letter from Nintendo. Who knows, I'm just speculating here. With the new HDMI signal, the NES side of the Super Retro Trio probably looks the most crisp of all. The game's compatibility is really good, but not great. Some of the most complex games like Castlevania 3 and various multi-cards work almost flawlessly. However, the compatibility of the previous model seemed better. I have cleaned all my games, but still, Dreamworld Pogi, a recent release by the makers of Dizzy, is glitching out, but worked fine on the original system. I'm especially bummed to see that the Everdrive N8 isn't working, and I'll get back to this later. Another game that didn't work for me is Micro Machines by Codemasters. I must say that there have been various revisions in the past, so your results may vary, and maybe a new version of the system can improve that too, but for now, I'm not too impressed with the NES side. Pin conversion adapters to play 60-pin Famicom games work fine as well. Games like Dordor Door and Star Wars are not a problem at all for the system. The NES Zapper won't work on flat screen TVs because the Zapper's light sensor relies on bright light phosphors of your CRT TV's bulbs. Another factor is the latency of modern displays. When the Zapper relies on a particular millisecond of the CRT's refresh rate, the Zapper does work quite well over composite on an old CRT. 
Unfortunately, the Superior S video port of the original Retro Trio has been removed on the Plus system. However, Composite comes in various qualities too, and the Composite on the Retro Trio is pretty great. I would say it's nice that it still has an analog output at all, because most people won't use this feature anyway. The original Retro Trio Super Nintendo portion of the console was already great for NTSC regions. However, there is some good news for Europeans now. The Retro Trio Plus now has a separate SNES region switch to change between 60Hz NTSC and 50Hz PAL. The Mega Drive or Genesis portion of the console already had it, but the SNES lacked this, so previously some PAL games would play faster than they should on the original. Only the NES and SNES portions of the system suffered from this. This was especially noticeable on games like Mario Kart, where the original game played too fast and left weird glitches and stripes. The PAL switch on the Retro Trio Plus has really fixed this. It's a great improvement for SNES game compatibility indeed. The PAL compatibility is also better when we have a look at Starwing, the European Star Fox. When playing on the old system it provided an odd additional challenge where you have to look past the glitches to fly your aircraft, but it works fine on the new system. I must say that I was impressed back then that it worked at all. Retrobit's previous system, the Retro Duo, could play this game too, making them the first company to achieve this on a hardware clone. That system had the same issue with Starwing though. Other games using the Super FX chip, like Stuntrace FX, worked well on the Plus, as well as Yoshi's Island and Doom, which both used the Super FX2 chip. And yes, Doom is this choppy on an original console. Super Mario RPG was always a tough nut for a clone console because it uses the SA1 processor chip. It already worked fine on the original Retro Trio. It doesn't really matter what Super Nintendo game you throw at this machine, it plays like a charm. The Mega Drive or Genesis is another great part of the system. Almost every game I've thrown at it works great, from the Sonic and Knuckles lock-on cartridge to Elysia Dragoon. Except for Micro Machines Military, which was only released in Europe. And the sad thing is, it did work on the original Retro Trio just fine, but on the Plus we get a widescreen of death. All other Micro Machines games work fine though. Micro Machines, Turbo Tournament 69 and Micro Machines 2. However, when I run Military on Everdrive, it does run. So it's most likely not the ROM, but perhaps the chips in this late release are incompatible. For these games, Codemasters made custom j card with an included multi-tab to play with four controllers. On all games, the colors and sound seem very close to the original. From what I've played in my mostly European PAL library, I'm really impressed. If you use the universal controller, there is one bummer though. Someone made a horrible choice to map the left shoulder button to the C button, which is often used for jumping or other actions. It makes you wonder who tested this thing. This is horrible when playing a game like Gunstar Heroes or a fighter that relies on trigger and d-pad combinations. But of course, you can always use your original Mega Drive controllers. Ah, and here's what happens if you don't clean or insert your cards properly. Don't you just love this? It's like in the old days, try getting this kind of nostalgia through emulation. This being a hardware clone not based on emulation means it will work with most peripherals. I'm sure some of you are interested in flash cartridges and most ever drives work great. The SD to SNES and Mega Drive card work just fine, as well as the Game Boy Everdrive. An exception, however, is the Everdrive N8 for the NES, which did actually work on the original Retro Trio, but as soon as you boot it up on the Plus, there's no LED, nothing. I'm really hoping a firmware update for this cartridge can fix this somehow, but I won't hold my breath. To play Master System games, I've tried two converters, the Powerbase Mini and the Master Mega converter. They both work excellent. Playing Master System games can also be achieved with an Everdrive flash cartridge, which works fine as well. As mentioned, the Retro Trio Plus is also compatible with the Super Game Boy, so it will allow you to play Game Boy games using original hardware just fine, including all the special borders and tools the Super Game Boy provides. When the first Retro Trio launched, Retrobit also offered their Super Retro Advance adapter, which played Game Boy Advance games. 
When used on an original SNES, you would need to use the composite cables. However, the Retro Trio was made so it could route the video signal to the TV without additional cables. Unfortunately, the Retro Trio Plus can do this. I could not get this adapter to work over HDMI, nor composite video via the Retro Trio's own output. Only with the cartridge connected composite cables it comes with, making the console function merely as a power source for the adapter. I must say that the Retro Trio Advance was a great thing to have, adding to the Retro Trio's library and offering great compatibility. However, I'm amazed that we still don't have a hardware clone or adapter that accepts Game Boy Color games on the big screen. The hardware is so similar to the original Game Boy. Have clone producers forgotten about the library of more than 1100 games? Right now, a GameCube with a Game Boy Player is still the best way to achieve this and if you have one of those, you should stick with that anyway, because it has perfect compatibility, it preserves the aspect ratio and has much better picture and sound, especially if you're running the superior Game Boy interface software on Swiss. Otherwise, the Game Boy adapter is a nice piece of hardware if you're not using HDMI and only have a handful of titles to play. It saves space and worked quite well, but it's far from perfect by any means. The Retro Trio Plus comes with a lot of switches, which all work great, but there's one switch missing and that is the switch to go from the stretched 16x9 widescreen ratio to the original 4x3 like the games were intended to be played. This can be corrected if your TV has a resize option or if you are using analog on an old 4x3 TV. I must note that the only decent comparable multi-console at this point is the Classic 2 HD, which does have an aspect ratio switch, but of course you can't play your Mega Drive games on that. There is another major drawback to the system which can be fixed with a workaround, and that is the sound. The Retro Trio does send audio over HDMI, but unfortunately it's mono on all systems, so you can't have stereo sound by default. Now, you can get stereo if you disable audio via HDMI on your TV and use the analog audio outputs instead. However, your left and right audio are reversed, so the solution is easy, just switch the plugs and you're good to go. I have tested this on all three systems and two TVs using test software by Artemio Urbina and Nintendo's own SNES hardware test program to verify. How they could have messed this up is a true mystery. If you do choose to switch the audio cables around, be aware that the system will not send composite and HDMI video at the same time. It will close off the composite video signal when an HDMI connection is detected. This also means that if you want to connect this system to an analog CRT TV and HDMI TV at the same time, the video on the CRT will only work when the HDMI TV is fully powered off. In conclusion, this is a great system and saves a lot of space. The colors are really nice and vivid, the sound is okay, but sometimes a bit off and I'm very happy with the 720p signal. The picture might be a bit soft compared to the FPGA alternatives, but to me it's more than sharp enough. You can suddenly spot details in pictures we just couldn't see back in the 90s, and nobody complained back then. I also like that this still has the RCA connections for composite video, so you can still have the option to hook this up to a CRT and enjoy some classic duck hunt. The only bummer about this system for me is the forced 60x9 aspect ratio, the minor speed and sound flaws and the incompatibility with the EverDrive N8 as of early 2018. The system right now will set you back about 80 US dollars and if you're in Europe like me the PAL version is about 120 to 140 euros or under 20 pounds, leaving Americans with the better end of the straw, especially when currency values are considered. And the US will also get a special edition soon that will be bundled with the RetroBits licensed Joe and Mac Multicard in ice blue. That looks really cool. If you can live with some of this system's flaws, overall I think it's a nice purchase and a great improvement of RetroBit's previous system, especially for European gamers like me. It plays almost every game I've thrown at it, and the performance is solid. I have used the original Retro Trio since 2015 and it still works great. While the plastics may seem a bit cheap, I'd say it's a durable, solid system with great compatibility overall. Whether you like this system like me, or you think it's a bunch of Chinese trash, I hope you find this review interesting. Please click on the like and subscribe button and thanks for watching. Cheers!